at the thing that preys on human fear and feeds on human flesh. From deepest space it came, and now man is the endangered species. It came without warning, and now it's coming for you. What's up, rotters, and welcome back to Blimit, the podcast that takes a deep dive into the best and worst horror films of the 80s and 90s. I'm Stevie, your VHS veteran. If you're listening for the first time, first of all, welcome, friends. I am a child of the 80s, and in this podcast, I head back to the VHS store of my youth to exhume those movies that lined the bottom shelf of the horror section. Most I haven't seen in decades, some are first-time watches, and some are staples of my movie rotation. Each week, I invite a special guest to join me, force them to watch a schlocky 80s horror, and then we have a gas over it. Sometimes I have horror aficionados, sometimes complete horror newbies. Next week's episode falls on All Hallows' Eve. And I have picked a suitably trashy, confusing, and preposterous Halloween-themed movie, Hack-O-Lantern from 1988, which is currently streaming on Shudder. Joining me will be singer-songwriter, podcaster, and pandemic superstar Sophie Ellis Bexter. Brain Rot also has a Patreon page where you can sign up for regular bonus content, including franchise retrospectives like Critters, Children of the Corn, Warlock, and more. And just recently, on the Cellar Dweller tier, I dropped the first episode of a very personal series of audio essays called Why Horror, which documents my journey through horror. In this first episode, I talk about the effects of growing up in Thatcher's Britain, my deep connection to the queer-coded masterpiece The Lost Boys, and my terrifying recurring nightmare that almost became a premonition. If you'd like to listen to the entire back catalogue and join me for my Why Horror journey, just head to patreon.com forward slash stevie's brain rot to sign up from just five pounds a month or click the link in the show notes this week Dan Schreiber returns after his fan favourite appearance on Brain Rot last year discussing Jaws the Revenge with his No Such Thing as a Fish co-host Andrew Murray. This time he's flying solo as we discuss Graydon Clark's bizarre cult classic sci-fi B-movie Without Warning from 1980. Uh, important PSA, there was very nearly no episode this week as I somehow forgot to record my audio. It's I know it's not the first time that this has happened. And just give me a break. I, I think I get a bit overexcited, but incredibly, due to a program that I use while recording, I managed to salvage the audio from my headphone microphone and mix that in. So apologies for the quality on my end, but hey, it's all worked out in the end. Dan Schreiber, welcome back. I am so excited to be back. This is uh, this is a show that I very arrogantly listened to the episode that we did before with Andy. So uh, many times. Oh, man. Uh, but this, yeah, your second time, this officially makes you a friend of the pod, as they say. Um, yes. How is life? You've got a lot going on, it seems. Books and babies. Books and babies. In about uh, 12 hours time, I should have another baby. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're heading to the hospital tomorrow morning at six in the morning. And we're having a C-section for my third child. We have, we got two boys, so we thought we'd try one more time uh, just to see mm-hmm. if we can get a little girl. So that was the big plan. And yeah, so heading in tomorrow. So, so you don't, do you know? Oh, we do know. Yeah. Oh, it is a girl. No, it's a boy. Another fucking boy. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> amazing i Insane. love that um but um uh, well also at the time this comes out um you will have so congratulations on another baby <laughs> oh thank you yeah nice <laughs> there you go <laughs> uh so you also your book's just been released right um tell yeah. us about that a little bit sounds exciting oh, okay oh yeah um this is a book that i've been sort of 
sort of um you know it's been stewing away in the background for the last i don't know two decades um mm -hmm. it's called the theory of everything else i'm very very obsessed with people who think differently and have lots of theories about what might be going on and yeah. i also think like a good theory about what how the universe is or how humans came about if it's funny it's it just is a great feeling as well so like as an example, one of the theories is that one of the leading anthropologists in the world is a guy called Lewis Leakey, discovered mm -hmm. more sort of like human fossils and primate fossils than anyone else in history, barring his wife and his son. And uh -huh. um, he believes that the reason humans became the dominant species of planet Earth is not because of our ability to fight off predators. It wasn't our cognitive brilliance. It wasn't all that stuff. It was just simply that we were too smelly to eat. <laughs> he just thinks that's that's why we survived. That's he, wonderful. He, yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? And he was he did a whole lecture on it, and um, no one believes him. And he said because he was out in a in the plains of of Africa, I think, and he was out one night with a buddy, and they got in a broken down car, and they were laying down for sleep, and a lion came up, sniffed him, and just went, Nah, no nah way. mate, and nah. then went off. <laughs> and then he started talking to his students, and they were like, "That's happened to me." They come and sniff. <laughs> So he thinks, is that it? Is that all it right. was? We just stank. We were t so. That's amazing. Who's to say yeah. he's wrong? Who's to say he's wrong? Well, a lot of scientists, but well, outside yes. of them, <laughs> outside of those people. So, but the book is sort of like I look into. There's a theory that pubic lice is going extinct because too many people are having Brazilian waxes. So wow, they're um they're being deforested. Basically, they've lost yeah. their natural <laughs> habitat. <laughs> And uh, I look into aliens and I look into ghosts and I look into just anything that kind of gives you goosebumps if you hear the story and it makes you feel yeah. alive for a second. I, I feel like that's the whole point of the book is to it's to distract you for a second and remind you that you're alive in this bizarre universe just for a second. Yes. But, so um, it's, to, it's to cause an existential crisis, basically. Exactly. But I also yes. say don't believe anything in it because nothing's <laughs> proved true. So it's a book of facts with uh, quotation marks around it. Yes. Heavily caveated. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. The idea is that scientists are desperately looking for the theory of everything. Not desperately, but they, what they really want to find is the theory of everything, which is this one unifying theory that takes because there's there's two different worlds of science. <laughs> Weirdly, I should have looked into this for the book, but I didn't. It's that um, <laughs> you've got physics and then you've got Newtonian science, I think, and the two don't work together. So they, uh -huh. there was this idea that string theory ages ago, I don't know if you remember hearing about that, but string theory yeah. was big. That was thought, what if that unifies it? And so that's the idea. They want to find this one grand, simple, beautiful theory. And my book is sort of saying, well, while they're busy doing that, millions of us around the world have our own ideas about what's going on. And this is this is the story of everyone who's looking into their own ideas. That sounds amazing. And I suppose, is it quite episodic then? So you can you can pick it up and put it down? Yeah, exactly. Each chapter is kind of self-contained. I opened it by just trying to show my my main shit. Uh, shit. My main thing is is that I want <laughs> uh, people to acknowledge that everyone is a little bit batshit. I think that's the like right. the main thing. And great things have happened off the back of people who were batshit. And mm -hmm. we're we're I think living in a time where we're trying to squash that down and try and say stop being weird and rationalism and so on. And I just think actually. It's quite fun being a bit weird and also it has changed the world so i first chapter i sort of make that point by showing that pcr which saved the world you know back in 2020 yeah. uh, by by simply you know it wasn't the the vaccine but it's it curbed the deaths by us being able to tell who had it from the spread and so on mm -hmm. that was invented by a guy called carrie mullis single-handedly Science probably would have got there, but he got there first, and he invented it in 1985, same year that he invented PCR, which has changed the world. He also claimed that he was abducted by a talking <laughs> raccoon who took him. It was a glowing <laughs> raccoon, which may have taken him to a spaceship, and he spent, he spent a lot of the rest of his life trying to find this raccoon and trying to Holy prove that that was real. Shit. And that's the guy who gave us PCR. That's a, oh, that's wonderful. That actually that makes me um that makes me feel more comfortable knowing that it's just another normal nuthead like me that yeah. <laughs> did that. That's wonderful. <laughs> well, you've mentioned ghosts and aliens and stuff. How about um it's Halloween season? Um, do you join in yeah. the festivities at all? Yeah, I mean, I grew up in Hong Kong and Australia, where Halloween is a bigger deal. It's not so much a big deal in the UK, and it's, it's growing. It's getting there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's growing. growing. But like as a kid, it was 
it was a big big deal in my life mm-hmm. so yeah i've always i've always been very keen on it and now that i have kids and they're dressing up as stuff i mean that's even more exciting so of course. yeah and like we do a kind of like we did royal tenenbaums last year which was really cool um, <laughs> Amazing. as a family yeah, as a family so that's my so wife good. bought all the red um we, we went as the ben stiller family you know right the, yeah the track jump suits. Suits. yeah the track yeah. suits yeah um not sure what this year is uh going to be theme wise because we got a new recruit you know this new baby yeah. is arriving just of course. in time adam's so, family yeah. could do adam's family we, we don't have the girl we don't have the ah. bloody girl which is what Damn we were it. going for fail <laughs> Um, oh, amazing! Well, yeah, it's obviously it's my it's kind of my Christmas. It's my favorite type of year. Um, but oh, of course, today, brain rot. It must be your yeah, obsession, oh, right? Yeah, I just I'm I'm in I'm in the zone completely. What are you and, What are you going as? Well, this is the thing. I'm panicking because it's just over a week away, and normally I take a month to plan it, and I haven't. But I mm. I'm going to throw something together, and it it will be epic because we always have a competition at work, and I nearly always win. Cool. So, yeah, need to sort that out. Um, but today, uh, yeah, we're going to be talking a little bit about Graydon Clark's Without Warning from 1980. It's an interesting little movie. Uh, it's basically a kind of a precursor to Predator because it's about mm. this alien hunting and killing for sport on Earth. But it's mostly a very delicate representation of Vietnam PTSD. <laughs> um, <laughs> what, uh, what did you think of it generally? I thought it was a stunner. I yeah. <laughs> 10 out of 10. I think I love I you know this is one thing that your podcast has made me realize is that I found my pocket now. I found my genre of movie where I just Beat. absolutely get sucked in and can't tear my eyes away from. This movie is I mean, you know, anyone else would say it was terrible. Uh <laughs> yes. any normal movie viewer might <laughs> attack it for its lack of budget uh, it's terrible acting it's weird ass script it's yeah. uh almost seemingly zero set um you know it's yeah and and absolutely insane characters um i read a fact about this movie which is so it's a it's a movie about an alien um which we'll get to in a bit but mm-hmm. it, you don't really see the alien until the end and then i I read it on IMDb as a little trivia piece saying, actually, you do see the alien earlier when the scout is uh, suddenly aware that something odd is going on. In the grass. In the grass. So I, I, I rewound through the movie to try and see if I could see the alien. And as I was doing that, I kept pit stopping along the way of all these random characters that appeared throughout the movie <laughs> and suddenly realized every character is absolutely Mental. mad um, it really is. so it was kind of wonderful actually trying to do the where's wally on this alien in an earlier scene <laughs> you realize they've just scripted it so that every piece has a pairing or a or a, just a group of odd characters so anyway wonderful movie yeah because it sort of starts off, off as a sort of series of vignettes before we actually get to the core it's like the group yeah. of scouts it's the father and his son and all that the thing is that struck me i haven't seen this for a long time but it actually it's shot very well i think and that's because mm. i think dean kundi is the dop who he'd just done halloween when he'd done this and then he did it subsequently all of john carpenter's films and he did jurassic park wow. and apollo 13. He, you know he's got the chops and i think you can really see wow it's, yeah it's shot the cinematography is actually really good all the angles and stuff it's just the the budget of what is on that he is shooting nicely <laughs> that is well, the problem the the budget is really odd as well because they had this is again I, I i couldn't really it's one of those movies where it's quite low budget and as a result there's not much trivia or like stuff about right. it that, that i could find so imdb is kind of my source yeah here. um so according to IMDb, the movie was made for $150,000. Yeah. 75,000 of those dollars went to two of the lead actors in it. Right. Jack Palance and Martin yeah, Landau. Jack yeah, Jack That's, That's half. That's half of your movie budget absolutely <laughs> shredded. And then 20,000 went on the alien head. On the alien head, of which yeah. you, you kind of see right at the. Uh, it's when you first see it, though, it's cool as it's this mm. glowing blue, which is really wicked. And then it doesn't glow blue anymore. Um, yeah, it's not so iridescent to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but that brings us down to 55,000 for the yeah. rest of the movie. <laughs> and so, and so what I want to know is, and maybe because you're so in this world, um, I just don't understand. What was this movie? Where did it come from? 
at what point was Jack Palance and Martin Landau in their career, these titans of cinema, who yeah. were they at this point that they were in this kind of low budget? I mean, the the lead actor, and oh, okay, so let me bring up the lead actor, the uh, Tara. So Tara, yes. When you watch an, when you watch a B movie, you want to get sucked in immediately and just think, is this this is a B movie, isn't it? Oh god, um, am yeah. I right? So, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Okay, so movie opens and we've got credits, and I think maybe Jack Palance's name comes up, Martin Lando's name comes up, and then we meet Tara, who was cast one day before the movie started <laughs> shooting. That. Yeah, and her uh, name is Tara Nutter. Nutter. <laughs> And I was in because suddenly, <laughs> you because you don't know what movie you're about to watch. Really, no. you know it's going to be a thriller. And when your yeah. lead actor, the actress, is called yeah. Tara Nutter, those and you're three thinking, names, oh, she... yeah, oh. you're just like, right, I'm, this this is a winner already. Yeah. Fucking I'm not, I'm brilliant, not going anywhere. Yeah, yes. it's the um the opening the opening scene though, which is this you know the son and the father, and he's hunting. And he's got, you know, he's learning to become a man. That's what's so important to all of the, the males so in this. And obviously the way to become a man is shooting. The only way to graduate yeah. from boy to a man is taking a life. And uh, yeah, we, we finally see one of these, these fleshy, hairy, toothy, fried egg discs. What did you think of these? Well, first off, I was fascinated by the relationship between the dad and the son, which goes nowhere and ends very quickly because they both <laughs> die. Yeah. But... It's a dad who, I mean, there's so much to unpack, even in just their relationship. <laughs> their history, you yeah. You could do a whole podcast just on that. They, <laughs> they, because they start off, and he's uh, the dad is a real hunter, and he's got his gun out, and then he wakes up his son who's overslept, and then, you know, apparently it's still like eight in the morning or something, and you see his feet in a caravan that they've clearly driven out to this area for hunting, <laughs> yeah. and um, then the son gets up, and the son's quite a buff tall dude with a big mustache but he's being presented as a sort of very um uh sensitive literature lover yes. basically <laughs> and so they go out and there's a, so he's kind of like his dad's trying to make him get into hunting and yeah. then his dad, I'm going to get the order out of it, uh, the order wrong a bit here, but the dad goes into his bag and he sees that he's he's sort of brought contraband, three novels. <laughs> and <laughs> this is like, uh, what are you doing with novels in the wild? You know, and, and <laughs> it's this big dramatic moment between, by the way, two characters, as I say, we're never going to see again in this movie. No. And, and then so they go off with two guns and mm. to show that the son is really not interested in hunting he he loses two of the bullets he like he uncocks it and lets the yeah. bullets out again it's not like someone will find these bullets later and it will be useful <laughs> yeah right it's not significant no it's just no use but then the weirdest bit is that the dad and, and so again these two people are here because they're the first victims of the alien that we will meet later but yeah. the dad sort of points the gun at the son yeah. Yeah, and half dead. has the idea of killing him yes <laughs> we see never... it. it really lingers on him it really yeah. lingers on him mulling it over going no one would find him you can see the entire thought process and then <laughs> It, well, does he decide not to, or is that when the alien gets him? So no, we'll he never decides know. not to. Yeah, he decides uh, right. not to. Yeah, right. And then, and then that's it. We get from them. Then suddenly, these flying alien discs land on them and start chewing away and corroding yeah. and, and sucking their blood. And these are our first victims. So then, boom! Yeah. You've got Martin Lando, Jack Palance, Tara Nutter, <laughs> crazy little dynamic. And then, boom! We're in. Yeah. Death. aliens fantastic yeah. and then it centers around mainly well i say it centers around our four teens uh, it's two really because again mm. th this thing where they introduce and develop some characters and then they just disappear very quickly because we've got tom and greg beth and sandy um yeah. and they called tom tom because he was ginger like a ginger tom Ah, That's and, what it, no, and, I made that up. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought that might be true. Tom, um, very famous. The only kind of like other CSI. famous actor. CSI. David Caruso. Yes. It's David Caruso. I know him from NYPD Blue, and right. he was in Rambo and stuff like that. Like he's a it's big crazy. deal. Yeah, and he so. The, these are the this is like the central grouping of this movie. Yeah. Even though two of them are going to die very quickly, um, they are they've. 
he, David Caruso is setting up this guy Greg on a date with Tara Nutter. And and then she's got her other you friend. You love with saying her. that, don't you? <laughs> it's a good name. I don't know name. why they didn't just call her that in the movie. Why <laughs> why bother with the other name? So she gets set up with yeah, um, with Tara Nutter, and then Greg. <laughs> They go in a caravan and they go away to this area where yeah. the dad has just died with his with his book reading son, and um, and they film this in December, by the way, because I remember watching it thinking the girl is the uh, Tara Nutters is sort of in a bikini <laughs> kind of thing. It, Dan. <laughs> what? <laughs> Every <laughs> single time <laughs> is her name. <laughs> so she's in a bikini and that's her like outfit and then they go for a swim in the lake and yeah. and then the other girl's in a bikini and it looks really warm but actually it was December and apparently it was ice cold in the in the lake. So I've I actually seen an thought... interview with Tara Nutter. <laughs> no. And, um, you? Yeah. And um, it, the interview starts going, what's my first memory of this? My first memory is I nearly died. And she, she's not very happy about it. because. But then it's a B movie. It's probably filmed late 70s, you know. And yeah. that's there was no health and safety. There was no forms to check, to sort of fill in and stuff. So you just had to do it. Yeah. And I guess, um, to me, it makes sense now. Because I think her acting is really stilted in the beginning. <laughs> I really was like, I'm not sure the day before hiring of this actor <laughs> was a yeah. good <laughs> smells of desperation but then as the movie gets on and she actually has clothes she on, warms she, up she's really good <laughs> yeah literally yeah <laughs> she literally warms up yeah, yeah. so but that so that's the that's the main thing they go off um um while david caruso is with this girl and the alien attacks and they go missing yeah and greg gives them about and so Greg and Tara Nutter are the two main people now of our movie, and we're going to stick with them for the rest yes. of the movie, right? Oh, great! Can't wait to hear that name another forty times. <laughs> so they they start looking immediately for David Caruso yeah. and and his girlfriend, um, quite sort of like dramatically immediately, given that you yes. know they clearly had gone away for a shag like for a for a weekend of of shagging so they're like you know he was basically cock blocking immediately <laughs> except except he was actually on his game because they they were dead well so, yeah fair enough yeah, yeah it works both ways <laughs> yeah um but yeah and so the movie starts that this is now the adventure this is now yeah and they obviously we meet we have small introductions to Martin Landau who is Sarge Fred uh, and Jack Pallant Pallants or Pal Pallants I yeah know. I it's was a, thinking that is, it's a it's a bass singer Bassinger thing isn't it it's one of those I was waiting for you to say it first when you did earlier <laughs> and then I just mimicked what you said I think yeah. I said Pallants yeah I, I think it is Pallants yeah yeah so we'll, we'll stick with that um, yeah. but he he kind of acts as the harbinger Pallants because he kind of does that you mustn't go down to that lake. Whatever you do, get away from that lake. Oh, that's right. They bump into him inside a gas station, gas station that is yeah. kind of closed, and they try and pay him. And um, yeah, that's yeah. right. So we we meet him, and you immediately go, "What are you doing in this movie?" <laughs> that's yes. your first thing, yeah. and then you think that's probably his only scene. He probably well, you know, that's it. Yeah, you think yeah. it's a cameo because because of the way it is. Oh, maybe they've just give gave him five grand to come and do one line as the harbinger. But then it's not it's not until quite a while later because you meet we meet Martin Lando in the toilet as well in a really awkward exchange with one oh. of the girls. Where was? Oh yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he's written on the, the warning on the door. Yes. And so you think, oh right, that's that then. So that's their part done. But it's not. They very come back. What did you think of those two performances? It feels a bit like a competition who could chew the most furniture, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. They really go for it. They really go for it, and it's the cinematography is really interesting. It reminded me of sort of old Hollywood when I was watching this, of where you didn't cut away, you just held a shot and you let acting happen. Yes. And I realized acting doesn't happen that much anymore in movies where it's just, okay, we're not going to move the camera. We're going to do the whole five minute scene. Would you just like just doing what you need to do? Yeah. Fly um, in the wall style. Yeah. And that's, that happens quite a few bits further down in the movie. There's a few more moments where it happens and you really see acting and, and Jack Palance is, is like, he gives it his all. It almost feels like theater in a way sometimes when you see these scenes play out. Um, mm -hmm. Because you're like, oh, my eyeballs are the one camera, and that's what that's what they've decided to do here as well. So, because of the nature of the script, which um, again, 
I loved it, but I think some other people would have issues with it. <laughs> yeah. I think the script doesn't match the level of acting that it's being treated with. <laughs> sure. Um, yes. Yeah. That's it's a bit of a juxtaposition in the performance and the dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we meet them quite briefly. They they say hi, particularly Jack <laughs> Palance more and what he's doing yeah. in this little shop that he's open. Don't go down to the lake and yeah. all that sort of stuff. They do go down to the lake. Of um, two of them die. Yes. And then, then we get the Cub Scouts as a little interlude. And then there's a little interlude with, again, <laughs> it feels like almost like a weird comedy skit where they forgot to put the jokes in because you've got this like absolutely yeah. bizarre Scoutmaster who's... <laughs> It's just I can't even I can't even think of how to place him. He's he he has a bunch of kids. They're there for some reason. He's doing shtick. That's the thing. It's, yeah, but but it's to no audience because it's obviously there's kids there, and so and it's not really for us. It's very bizarre because he's sort of doing oh what and trying to be silly and doing one liners. And also yeah. again, it's about teaching the boys to be men. You know, I suppose this isn't very long after Vietnam, so I guess the, you know everyone's just being prepared for war. Anyone any young male. But it's just a very strange, and I, I looked him up to see if maybe he's a comedian and he was doing a bit of his act. But yeah, no, no, just no. Nope. <clears throat> that, but he, oh. when he tries to light his cigarette with a rock, is that a thing? I've that's amazing. So the first thing is he. I mean, it doesn't work before we say it's amazing. It, yeah, yeah, that's it. But what's amazing <laughs> is the kind of normality that we're meant to just accept it with. Yes. So. So first off, what we do is we cut back to these. Uh, there's a scoutmaster, and he's got these kids that he's and he's getting them to just uh, c collect a a bit of wood or a stone or something. Yes. That's that's yeah. like the mission. Collect collect yourself a bit of stick or a bit of stone, <laughs> and and they go off and do that. And then suddenly he turns around, and the plot line suddenly becomes without really it being spoken how parched he is. He's really thirsty <laughs> and. <laughs> And he sees the caravan that belonged to the dad who had yes. the book reading son. And he kind of like tries to make his way up to it and he slips. And it's clearly an improvised slip because it reminded me almost like when you're in theater school and someone says, okay, um, you now need to act sort of like just getting from this bit of the room to the next room. And you just have to, you're watching people just throw in some random acting just for the right. sake of like yeah. having something to do. He looks like he slips for no apparent reason. He then gets up to the ha to the van and he's like, can you help us, please? We need drinks, which is not a part of like, they're not lost. Drink. They're not anything. I think he says that. I think he's like, we need something. He's desperate. He's desperate to quench everyone. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But that's no, there's no like them, you know, when he's asking everyone to run off and find sticks and rocks, there's no sense of like, don't worry, I'll get us out of here. I know we're all so thirsty. <laughs> yes. There's nothing of that. And so he's smacking on the caravan door and he gets he gets no response and that's when we hear the <laughs> the soundtrack by the way of the movie which is basically someone just jamming on some synth the yeah. whole movie like falling onto the casio yeah <laughs> yeah proper casio synth no apparent theme just uh, just a new riff each time yes. and then we cut to the grass and supposedly if you watch this movie if you're listening to this this is where you see the alien now i went back a couple of times i didn't see it did you oh i did yeah really where is it yeah. in the shot it's right in the center of the screen uh towards the back of the grass and you can just see half of its blue head and a bit of its sort of uh, netting but Great. it's not it's not very obvious they you know they um they very much it's the it's like the fin in jaws you know they they're saving it properly it's not very clear yeah yeah but you i do, mean it's, yeah, you, yeah it's easy to miss I, do, I mean, nice little nugget. I went, I went back, and I just didn't see. Man. It. Yeah, which ah, is so that's interesting. So interesting. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so anyway, it, um, he then <laughs> we, it gets us to the moment where he suddenly decides. While well, suddenly, all the kids have disappeared. I don't know where they've gone <laughs> at this moment. He's well, they've gone to find sticks, haven't they? <laughs> they're going to find sticks and stones, and he and he decides to have a cigarette. And I think he sees on the ground the revolver and something from the dad and the son, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, again, it's just there. There's no, there's no reason for it to be in the movie that he doesn't then put two and two together. Like, no, what if they're missing? And they're like, nothing's put together. He just, <laughs> it just happens to be where he is. Just sees it. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> so then he doesn't. He's looking for a match, and he doesn't have a match, and he he leans 
he decides to try and light his cigarette by by this is I, it's real it's really bizarre he picks up a I, bit of stone and tries to light it by slamming the bit of stone in a kind of flint like yeah. um, shave of the stone to get a flame because he, he obviously because he has to suck at the same time he obviously has to put his head basically on the yes. ground onto yeah. a rock <laughs> and then get a stone and start smacking the end of the cigarette, <laughs> thinking it's going to light. Now, I understand maybe the flint idea or using wood or something, but you like, surely you'd light a leaf and then just use that as a match. But yeah, to actually exactly. <laughs> horizontally get yourself on the ground and start smacking. And then he gets really angry that he knocks the cigarette with the stone. I mean, it's your own fault. It's, it's right there. I tell you what, though, there's a whole there's a thing I once read, which is that if you get cast in a Shakespeare play, it doesn't matter what role you get cast in because Shakespeare wrote 3D characters. Even if you have a single line, which is a mm. passing you, that it's a memorable character because Shakespeare made the characters memorable. What this guy has done in this role <laughs> is he has absolutely amplified <laughs> a non-existent role to the point where look at us. We can't. Yeah. We can't stop, stop talking, talking about it. Why did he randomly fall before he got it's to the like carry? It's like that, as you say, the fall. It's because yeah, yeah, an actor being told to walk from one corner to the other, they'd stop and do their shoelace, or you know, check the time and do something. You're yeah. right, just to flesh it. He and did his he's job. having a whale of a time. Yeah, he absolutely. Did his job. He absolutely <laughs> nailed st sticking out in this movie so much <laughs> that. He's he's like main cast as far as I'm concerned. Um, so yeah, so then uh, then he gets up and then suddenly he's hit by this alien thing, yes. which the father and son were hit by, and we are we're suddenly watching his death and the kids see him dying. The kids are suddenly back, and <laughs> classic classic. No children were harmed. Um, all the kids get off scot-free. So the aliens yes. clearly, my thinking at this point is, ah, the, the aliens have no interest in children because he has a whole grouping of kids that he could have murdered here. But no, he's just gone for the adult. Yeah. It, it's interesting, isn't it? Because normally this sort of place would be set somewhere really out back and obscure that hardly has any visitors. And so far... We have seen so many people visiting this very small area. Yeah. It's very, it is a hotbed for tourists <laughs> and activity. It's, it's not the best place for an alien to be hiding out that no one can actually locate. Yeah. Because it is full. And also, quite a dangerous area outside of the alien. If you've got two hunters standing in the exact spot where scouts are walking around, happily yeah. just offloading guns. <laughs> shooting bullets in the area what is what is this yeah. area <laughs> we don't yeah, see but... any animals by the way i don't know what they're no, hunting but then we have is it tom and beth i can't even remember or greg greg, greg and Taranata. greg and Taranata. that's the one because she falls into a trap one of those massive traps of the ball, which i thought was the aliens trap but we find out later it's actually martin landau's trap because he's yes, trying to get right. the alien um but they find the bodies don't they yeah, so we're back to them, and they're still on their hunt, and they're wandering around, and yeah, and she did, she Tara Nutter did that stunt on her own. That was her stunt. What the falling in? Yeah. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> sake! So not only was she all of her internal organs trembling with cold, she had to fall <laughs> seven feet into a massive ditch. Amazing. Exactly. I'm pretty sure as well the guy who plays Greg. I looked into his IMDb, and yeah. I think I'm right in saying this. Um, he he goes on to be. In a lot of movies, in RoboCop three, um, uh, but he's he's he does stunts in the movie. Oh, he's a, yeah, he's he suddenly his filmography is like there's a lot of stunt work that he does. Oh, I moved into that. Yeah, I wonder if it was because of this moment, not doing the stunts yeah. in this movie. <laughs> Maybe it was jealousy that that drove him into his <laughs> I, career. I can do stunts too. <laughs> yeah. I can do stunts. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, so then they um so he gets he gets her out of the pit and he they find a shed. And I believe the shed is the only built bit of set for the entire yeah. film. Yeah. They go inside the shed, uh, they discover um David Caruso dead, which is exactly the kind of thing he'd investigate years after in <laughs> yes. subsequent acting jobs. <laughs> he'd get to the bottom of it. Yeah, and um, there's a, it's, I think there's a story that he was offered the head of his dead character, um, oh. 
like he said i'd love to have it after i yeah. um, made the movie and then he saw it and he was like it's so disturbing i don't actually want it uh, oh. in my house yeah so it's just a bit of trivia there i love it i know it looks really cool yeah. um and so they're both dead so suddenly they're freaking out and they need to get out of there and that's mm. where now that this is now where the movie kicks off really because they understand that something weird is going on but they're not quite sure what because why their friends why their friends dead and hung up like trophies yeah but also yes. at this point you kind of go shit it's it's sort of 15 minutes in and we've just got is it just going to be these two but of course no they jump in the car you get you get the oyster on the car i'm going to keep calling them oysters um mm. and this is when we see that it has those teeth and it reminds me of a lamprey have you seen a lamprey yeah i have yeah they they are an abomination and i've had nightmares about them because they're real it is like a, a bit of every kid's nightmare created it's this fucking worm with a sucker and circular teeth and this is just like it and it they're one of my biggest fears i think lampreys really yeah wow. yeah i mean they're like, scary they are they're, they're like they're mental they're like the worm from june or um yes, the, the exactly. mongolian death worm which is a cryptid animal uh which supposedly lives in mongolia just mm -hmm. so you're fine but okay. if you do encounter one watch out it will try to kill you by spitting acid out of its mouth what are you talking about lightning bolts out of its anus is the <laughs> oh, that's what it. the mongol that's what the mongolian it's a it's a um cryptozoological animal like a yeti right. or a bigfoot yeah i see anal lightning bolts is a is partly to blame well, for I, it well i'm gonna i'm not i'm not gonna take the piss i don't want to cause any cultural tension but yeah that's <laughs> 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 uh, but they, um, of course, they pull up to the, uh, a country bar, and to establish it's a country bar in a movie, what you've always got to do is you have to start with a joke between the regulars and the clientele. So you know the yeah. barmaid's going, "Huh? Did you ever find that long lost wife of yours?" Nope. <laughs> the other guy says, "Didn't look too hard neither." <laughs> and of course, Greg enters as the locals are all laughing and show that they're a close knit family. It's just it's got to be done. It's a yeah. right passage. Yeah, and it's um one one quick point which stuck out to me as a kind of almost bizarre thing, and then they carry it through for the rest of the movie is yes. when they're in the car and the oyster lamprey thing is yeah. sucking on the window. So so they've they've escaped, but they these things start flying towards them, and they they're definitely under attack. And they yeah. get into the van, which is the van which David Caruso and his girlfriend had driven there in and they drive away. And so one goes on the windshield and they manage to get rid of it by putting on the, the wipers. So they get it off. Now at this point, when they get it off, I know what you're going to say. <laughs> they've just seen their two best friends because mm -hmm. it was their best friend each dead, hung yep. up like trophies with yep. their faces melted. Eyes missing. Yeah. Eyes missing. They've been attacked by aliens in the car. Attacked by aliens. Mm. Um, a lot going on. <laughs> Tara's freezing because it's December. Yes. yes. And she's had to go in a lake in a and bikini. And fall down a pit. <laughs> and fall down a pit. It's but so suddenly they start laughing when they manage to get it off. It's all over. Yeah. Yeah. And so to begin with, you think, okay, the laughter is a bit out of place, but well, I'll mention it as we go on. It happens at really odd moments where... Like in the house later. Oh, my God. Yeah, okay. We'll get yeah. to that. Bit. <laughs> yeah. so, I, I'm so, so just... glad you picked up on that as well. It's because It's so weird. In such traumatic surroundings and all the things that are happening, they keep kind of shrugging things off and going, oh, let's yeah. crack on. It's so ridiculous. There's I'm glad one, you picked I, up on that. Oh, I mean, how can you not? It just keeps <laughs> happening. And yes. It just seems, but it doesn't happen as in bad acting. It just happens like it's like, wow, what? Yeah. who are these characters? <laughs> yeah. Again, you know, they really stick out for it. So we get to the bar. As you say, they're having this big old joke on the inside. And yes. then these two people um, run in, Greg and Taranato, and they say, mm. guys, we've got an issue you here we have i've just remembered you did this with mario van peebles as well <laughs> <laughs> kept saying his name because you love it <laughs> i think you just it's your fault you've picked two movies that happen to have landed the two best names i've ever come across the credits um, so they get into the bar and they yes. say we need to call the police there is an alien or something. I guess. Do they say alien at that this, point? I don't well, think they say they my know friends are on. dead. That's right. But then yeah. when they, I think they mention it because then they go, oh, 
sounds like they've seen some of your flying aliens, uh, of yes. course, and then you get the reveal. Martin Landau's there, and he's screaming, calling everyone soldier, <laughs> and everything's yes. in order. So he's he's a he's an ex he's a veteran, and mm. he's been fighting the corner that aliens are here for ages, and no one believes him so suddenly here are two people that are helping yeah. to vilify him and this is a confusing scene now that i'm trying to remember how it plays yes. out um well it's a, well he's obviously at the bar and then he's saying oh i told you it was true we need to capture them or we'll go and kill kill the aliens and then we've also now got this is where it ramps up because we have um martin La ja no, Jack Palance. <laughs> for fuck's sake, because they, they suddenly become very similar characters. Yeah, and we realise that he's got a connection to these aliens as well. This is only when he he take goes outside and he finds one of the oyster things and he takes it and puts it in a a jar that's waiting, like ready for him to capture one, and yeah. he forces the kids to take him to the shed because we later find out that he's had a run in with one of these things. But also, the sheriff gets shot by sarge yeah so the before they leave yeah suddenly sarge has so sarge, sarge being martin land out yes. suddenly has a weird moment pulls out a gun and shoots the sheriff and then and there's other things that are going on like the lights go out inside the... that's right yeah and again i think i think that when the sheriff comes in i think he mistakes it for the alien because of his hat because his ah, hat is like the yes. rounded head. So when he's in silhouette, that's why he thinks it's one of the aliens. Nice. Okay, he thinks it's the alien. Okay, so it's not him going nuts. It's just no. uh, belief in it. Well. <laughs> well, he is he is nuts anyway. Um, yeah. But he, there's a moment where the lights go out and they're all sitting and they're like, we'll call, we'll call the police. We'll call the sheriff, which is who arrives. And we'll do, let me fix you some food is the person running yes. the bar who offers that when the lights go out and she has to go out and fix it. Suddenly you're now thinking, cause they say, Oh, the lights go out all the time here. Mm -hmm. so obviously you're going, well, this must be connected. The alien is feeding off electricity in the area. Right. Something's going, no, no connection. It's just the lights, <laughs> just the, the lights, lights happen right to have gone up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So Sarge is suddenly um he's aghast. Like, how did I how did I do this? Why why did I shoot? And he's trying to work it out. And then he suddenly makes the connection between the the two new kids that have come in, thinking, hang on, this <laughs> right. is you. you since you things, arrived. Yeah, since you arrived two minutes ago, things have got yeah. weird and I've yeah. shot someone. It's the same day. Yeah. <laughs> You've done this. And so he suddenly is pointing the gun at them and Jack Palance kind of just walks up and punches him, I think. I think there's or <laughs> a this, fight happens a very between very strange them. punch in the stomach. In the stomach, that's right. Manages to disarm him and then he takes the, the two of, the, of them to go and look for the shed. And that's where we now get acting with yes. the one the one shot because right. Jack Palance is sorry, Martin Landau is trying to justify while a gun's being held at him now, his very own gun back at him by one of the other bar guys. And I actually think this is where the overacting happens a bit too much because he doesn't know where to put his head or what it's like no <laughs> one's no one has said cut and he's just continuing the acting. So he's just having to make new connections with the elements of the scene of which there are a lot this is a, there's a sheriff who may be dead on the ground the two kids have just been taken out with jack plants after he's been punched in the gut and he now has to look at the bar people who are holding a gun at him but he has to visit all of these places with his head <laughs> he stays connected to each moment yeah and he gives each moment it's it's acting moment so but because it's a one shot, it just really sticks out. Of right. <laughs> and the final, the final bit of scene of that he's giving is to look at the bar and the gun, and that's when you see, like, ooh, uh -huh. you, the the acting's been really given its stretch test here. Yeah. Um, it's like he's doing his own editing, his own like different camera shots from yes, different angles, yes, basically, exactly. but on one shot. <laughs> yeah. It's like, great, you re reset. We can get that on another camera. No, no, that was the one, buddy. <laughs> no, that was all of them. Yeah. Is it? Oh, okay. Uh, well, no budget? Good. No, we paid yeah. you half the budget. And then the alien head is the... <laughs> it's really chewed it up. But he, he kind of takes the kids by gun to go and see the 
um, he forces them to show them the shed because then because then he shows a scar on his arm and goes, "Oh, the aliens once got me." Um, yeah. But when we get to the shed, obviously they really enjoy this set piece because we get exactly the same amount of time on each of the bodies that we did exactly earlier. It's the same order and the same <laughs> amount of time. Up <laughs> close up with that one, then move on to that one. And then we move on to that one. So all four of them, we get the exact <laughs> same sequence, which is nice. But the thing is, they haven't reused it. They've just reshot exactly the same. Lovely. <laughs> Slightly yeah. different. I can't fully remember that scene. I don't know why. There's so, I guess maybe I was so taking in so much that you, you're, bound to, you're bound to blank out. It, yeah, exactly. It's a lot. But he gets one of the lampreys in the leg and the other two, they stop the police car and it turns out that it's Landau. And then this is where oh, I really yeah. noticed. And I had to, and I rewound after this to go and back to some of his other scenes. Did you know Martin Landau doesn't blink? Well, hang on. Sorry. Let me clarify. In this movie, <laughs> um, you never see him blink on screen. It's not a real condition of his. Um, so I think that must have been a choice. You can just see him, can't you? Going, I know. I know what I'll do. I know what's, what'll show PTSD. And so I, I can just imagine he took it super seriously. Like, how many takes did he accidentally blink and demand another take? And he just got to just picture the, the director, like, you know, it's really. It's not necessary. It's not directed. But yeah, I went back and he never blinks on screen. And he never blinks. But yeah. isn't that a technique? Who who did that as well? Someone like Michael Caine. You're right. Blinked. Yeah, I remember. I can't think. Of, maybe it was Michael Caine. But yeah, it's you've heard it a few times throughout sort of Hollywood history. Yeah. To never be seen. But, to never... this, is, but this isn't the sort of film. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that. Well, okay. So we've, we've jumped over a couple of things here as well, Have by we the way. So... Jack Palance gets attacked by the alien um, oyster thing, which we yeah. learn later in the movie is it. They look kind of like they're like independent, <laughs> sentient aliens that are sort of right. like like mini UFOs, almost like flying and and crash landing onto a, a target that they found. We later find out that it's actually just one alien sort of frisbeeing with precision. Yeah, ninja darts. Yeah. Ninja darts. <laughs> These alien oysters on TV. He just has so, them in his pocket. Yeah, he's just living. Sort of These organisms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't see. He doesn't really have like a swag bag or anything. No. It's just, he just pulls them out from somewhere. <laughs> um, but so Jack Palance get it. We get a very protracted, um, he's dead. He's laying on the ground while the others are running away yeah and then he just kind of gets back up and yeah. and then falls down again you think oh he's dead this time and then he <laughs> kind of gets back up again and he's cutting the la he's cutting off the oyster thing and um so in between then they've obviously had martin landau at gunpoint and they've put him in the back of the sheriff's car yeah. So he's there with the with the metal grating, mm -hmm. and you hear him suddenly. Really, now that he's killed someone, he's he's now no longer in America. He's back at war. Yes, and he's, he's in the saying jungle. out loud. He's back in the jungle, and he's saying, "Sergeant, we're like he's." So you know now he's flipped. He's properly yes. flipped. Here's the scene. I don't know if I've blanked this out as well that I have missed. How is he suddenly? No, we don't see it. We don't, we see, don't it. see. Okay, it, no. so we out have of to, nowhere, we have to put that together ourselves. <laughs> that scenario happens off screen. The because they do a reveal that it's him in the front after the kids have been in it for a while. So then we're meant to go sort of sort of retrospectively go. Oh, hang on. So so there's been there's been a little incident, hasn't there? Back at the uh, back at the bar. So he he's put in the back seat of the sheriff's car. Doors clearly <laughs> closed. Yeah. Something a cut scene means that he has talked whoever put him in the back seat <laughs> into letting him out he's 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 knocked them out he's now got in the police the sheriff's car and he's yeah. driven away so that's a thing we just don't get to see at no. all um take and it as red take it as red that that's just yeah fair yeah. enough silly mm -hmm. why why include that bit of script sorry <laughs> um so so uh at this point jack palance has looked like he's died twice but he's actually fine and you can sort mm -hmm. of see in the distance the two scuttling away um they managed to make it onto the main road and they're trying to hail down a car the first car that comes along they miss second car they jump in the middle of the road and then suddenly the woo lights come yeah. on of the sheriff's car yes it's a sheriff you get in the back seat turns out after a lot of them talking to the yes. sheriff with zero response 
<laughs> which would which they don't seem concerned about. It's a red flag, isn't it? Yeah. Not 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 even a question from the policeman. What's up? Why are you in the middle of the road? Just yeah. He just in. they hop in, the door closes, <laughs> and he just starts driving like he's a really antisocial Uber driver. Yeah. Basically, like he's just got zero chat. Doesn't even ask for the name, and they're just going. There's a, there's aliens, and Jack Lance has been shot, and we're in the bar. It, it, there's a lot of dialogue before finally he turns his head and reveals <laughs> that he is Martin Landau. And um, I can't remember what he says at that point, but he sort of alludes to them. Oh, because he thinks that they're he thinks the aliens. That they are the aliens, yeah. yeah. And that the aliens are now doing a body snatches type thing and disguising yes. themselves as the kids. And so he's, he's, he wants, but the thing is, he doesn't want to kill them. He wants them to tell them, tell him the plan. Because he's mm. like, what is it? What what's your big invasion? Why are you here? Plan, yeah. yeah. And uh, but then eventually Greg decides, all right, I'll play along, otherwise he's going to shoot us. And Greg does a, a slight, suddenly adopts an almost British accent to be a more convincing alien. He kind of goes like, ah, your world is speaking to. S- Why am I doing that? Wait, I'm British. I don't need to put on that. Oh, did I just do South African? I don't need. I I just need to talk normally. Why did that happen? Uh, he's, but he starts to, you know, draw and go, oh, your world is split into seven and we are going to, you know, colonize this and that. And then he obviously jumps in to get the the gun out of his hand. But he, ju- he jumps in, by the way, when he says, um, and when do you plan to do your attack? Like the right. line is something like that. And he's like, we plan to do it now. now! <laughs> and then he goes and hits him with the gun. Like it's a bit of dialogue like that, which is wonderful because you, yes. you never... The the element of surprise is slightly, even if just a millisecond gone, when you say, I'm going to do it now. <laughs> yeah. um, that's always, it just reminds me, that's always, you know, when towards the end of a film, when it's the final person versus the bad guy. And instead of killing the protagonist, the, the bad guy, the antagonist always likes to give the speech of why he's done everything and what the big plan is, you know, and giving this person time to think how they can defeat him. And it's, it's one of those moments just, you know, giving them a heads up that I'm about to jump you. Yeah. But also it's like, it's just a little extra bit of time where things can go wrong that are not necessary to yes. build that time into the element. I always thought that about the, I mean, this is a massive spoiler of if you haven't seen the final Avengers movie. Is it a spoiler to give away the ending of that? Um, well, think? maybe uh, it is. Maybe it is. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it's it. It's been around for a while now. But also, if you haven't seen it, then it's just. To be honest, it's... in the pandemic, though, I hadn't seen any of them. And I did all 24, whatever it is, of the Infinity, yeah. um, the Infinity Saga completely, all 24 of them. And it was one of the best experiences of my life. Wow. I was sobbing at the end of Endgame. Oh my god, I actually genuinely feel like if I had one opportunity in a time machine, it would be to go and watch that movie in the cinema with nerds, because I didn't see it in the cinema, I saw it on a in on an airplane. I mean, just wow. I've actually watched footage of a cinema in America me too, where you could have you, and there's <laughs> yeah. there's a certain moment where yeah. some someone grabs something and it's a very special moment yeah. and the cinema erupting and i got chills just watching them watching it it's, it's incredible i actually that introduced me to the world of watching nerd reactions on youtube generally there's a great one which i highly recommend watching which is the trailer for the the latest batch of Star Wars movies where yeah. Daisy Ridley and so on. Mm-hmm. And it's a moment where I think it's trailer number two and it's just been introduced by J.J. Abrams and he goes off and there's this moment where you see the Millennium Falcon flying through and everyone's like, yeah, and then it goes dark and you can just hear the cinema in silence and then you just hear, Chewy, we're home. And, then uh... it, and you see Harrison and Chewie and it fucking erupts yeah. and oh uh, god it's wonderful uh, i love anyway. shit like that anyway <laughs> yeah. so yeah anyway uh, so we won't spoiler it we won't spoiler yeah fair uh, enough that but he does that thing he 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 builds in this little extra and now kind of moment mm-hmm. and knocks away the gun which then leads to a chase where yes. martin landau is now trying to get them he's actively shooting his gun at them so yes. he's trying to kill the alien yeah which leads to one of the most bizarre moments of the movie, which maybe you've got more insight into the psychology of what's going on here. Mm-hmm. But he manages to track them down onto a bridge. Yes. And he's in a car mm-hmm. trying to kill them. And yeah. they're on foot. Yeah. 
and they appear to be outrunning the car. <laughs> yes. And I can't work out. I thought at first, okay, he's obviously not trying to kill them. He's just trying to keep up with them. Trailing them, cause yeah. Because he, he could mow them down. But then as soon as he gets out, <laughs> he starts firing his gun at them when they <laughs> jump off an extraordinarily... So yeah, yeah. So I just can't tell. Maybe maybe he was. Maybe he was like, I can just I can trail them and see what happens here. But he gets them onto a bridge and they realize their only bit of escape here is to leap off a bridge so high <laughs> that you would absolutely just be pancaked to death <laughs> by hitting the water below. The water, yeah. It is so it's high. It's like Golden Gate, yeah. It's Golden Gate high. It is absolutely <laughs> insanely high. <laughs> They land, he leans over and starts shooting his gun. Yeah. And what should be, you know, death level injuries. Um, mm. Melted bones, like melted bones, exactly. Crushed. Broken back. Opening line from Tara Nutter Oh, I think I've sprained my ankle. <laughs> yes. That's. <laughs> That's the extent of the injuries of jumping off the this ankle. five thousand foot tall bridge. <laughs> <laughs> it's insane. That's Wonderful. really for me the weirdest like bit of the movie, just in terms of like <laughs> that. Just that didn't... is just the physics of it all. <laughs> yeah, it's just I didn't buy it. I was, what is this? <laughs> That's not realistic. That just that though. Except they, we get for the weirdest bit of the movie now, which is this. This next is bit. what I was going to say. This this yeah. this final the sort of climax because they find this house in the woods, and it's such a strange section because the tension disappears and then it starts to build from the bottom again. It doesn't yeah. keep where we're at. You know, they've been in a chase. They've jumped off a bridge and it plummets, and then it's all about the alien again. It also who is someone else in this house because they break in. She decides to go to bed. This is one of the moments you talk about where they have a little laugh and then she cries over a music box. It's yeah. an emotional roller coaster. They, I, so they, they break into this house, which they're like freaking out. Is anyone in this house? And mm -hmm. their decision is we'll stay in the house until, until we work out what's going on. Let's not be massively on our guard. Let's change into pajamas. Yes. Like it they really get changed through. in using whoever lives there as closet. <laughs> they just start changing clothes. She gets into bed. He decides to have a coffee. But before this, there's a noise. And That's uh oh, right. shit, is it the alien? So they go looking around the house. In their pajamas. In their pajamas. He gets near the door. And then suddenly, uh, he's freaked out because despite having seen their friends yeah, yeah, faces yeah. melted hung up like trophies gone flying into a bar toothy discs flying toothy discs from seen a man get alien. shot yeah seen him get shot been chased down by a war vet who thinks he's back in the jungle <laughs> in his car shot at <laughs> jumped up a five thousand kilometer high tall bridge uh, sprained her ankle she decides in this petrifying moment that she's going to be the person who pranks Greg <laughs> right. by jumping out in the dark and going boo when they think an <laughs> aliens in the house. <laughs> it, What's going on in their heads? And then he's like, "Hey, you scared me." And she's like, yeah. "Sorry." And anyway, then they both laugh it off. They both and, laugh it off. And then yeah. again, after all of those things, the aforementioned things, he thinks the freakiest thing to happen is the fact that he forgot he fit he thought he turned off the tap but it's on and then he thought he turned off the cupboard light but it's on which then actually makes me wonder so is that the alien is he is he fucking with them yeah is that exactly. part of his fun to, exactly. to sort of make them question their sanity is that cupboard, part of his game the cupboard light is on the yeah the the water is on we have no resolution to find out whether or not anyone played into that. She <laughs> picks up a plant and says it's not watered for a yeah. while, so no one's been here for a while. Again, we don't, that. we don't open a door and discover a dead person who lived in the house. We, <laughs> we, we will never know whose house this was and why they weren't there. Man. We have no idea. So she, again, petrified, having mm -hmm. cried over a music box for some reason, yeah. and... <laughs> in pjs decides to get some sleep so she hops yeah. into the bed greg makes himself a coffee <laughs> greg makes himself a coffee and goes and sits and watches tv or is just sitting with a coffee yeah um now sadly this is where we say goodbye to greg yes because yeah she 
we get a good old uh hey you sleeping moment and obviously because he's on a swivel chair that's perfect isn't it all she has to do is give it a gentle push and then he's got one of the lampreys on his cheek and then finally at 81 minutes and 58 seconds into the movie yeah we get an actual good look at the alien yeah now you said earlier you think it looks great i think for me because it's rick baker who is amazing so he he was paid 20 grand to do this just make the head and he he won the academy award for american werewolf in london and he's one of the best sfx designers the world has ever seen i think because i already knew that i don't think it's his best and i know it's right. very early on it's low budget i think the alien looks really camp <laughs> i think it looks like it's pulling a really sassy face and going Woo! it's just <laughs> i find it really really fey <laughs> and unthreatening but I think it's amazing. Well, what it looks like is a Mars Attacks alien. Yeah. It's got that style head, but it's a blue glowing the mega head. mind, yeah. Um, and it's played, by the way, by a guy called Kevin Peter Hall, who's inside the alien, who then goes on to be inside Predator. He's he's the... <laughs> what a career. Yeah, what a, step, what a career, uh... right? He's He is Predator. He's the alien in Predator. Um, it's the same the character. It's the same character. This was, yeah, this was like when Walt Disney left his first production house where he had Oswald the Rabbit, and he then literally drew <laughs> over it to create Mickey Mouse. He's, it's, just, it's just a different alien clothing. Um, they don't. But... They definitely don't try and let us see it in the light for too long, though, because mm. obviously in this room, the, the overhead light has been knocked, so it's constantly swinging, so he's going in and out of shadow and in out of light um, but also the, th- the thing my favorite thing is she's screaming this scene ends by the alien's hand stopping the swinging light so it just steadies it you know it's good to know that that's universally irritating <laughs> on the eye <laughs> because she's left the room and it's like oh i can't have that and it just stops the light and steadies it so it's not swinging that's so funny <laughs> i forgot that yeah but also just before that um another moment of the she's she's run out of the house when she sees that greg is dead and got this thing on his face she makes her way downstairs and then rather than you know whatever it is that was in the house clearly has an understanding of the house rather than her running out and running into the forest she then just basically (laughs) runs to the downstairs of the house and goes back in (laughs) and (laughs) the alien walks casually walks past the window because he's like well i'll just use the door to get in to get to her (laughs) Um, and she's sitting there and she thinks the alien's gone. And again, in this moment, cracks a massive smile. Like she's like, "Eh, (laughs) fool of the alien. (laughs) So again, just another smile, another like moment of her. How can, after everything they've been through, how can anyone even raise the side of their mouth, let alone go into a full relief? Smile. I think maybe because maybe the director was going around to each of these actors going, what are you, what are you going to bring to this role? And she's like, well, what do you mean? I was just going to act it. And he was like, can I, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I shot an amazing scene earlier today with the guy who played a scout master. And <laughs> this guy, he's going to be the talked about thing in this movie because yeah. he's just pulling out some new moves. He laid his head down on a rock to light a cigarette. <laughs> We didn't even ask him to do that. And Landau, I haven't seen him blink once. That's what he's bringing to the table, Nutter. So what, what are you bringing? What are you bringing, Tara Nutter, to this movie? What if I smiled? <laughs> every like, time. Every time. things happen. Like a little win, just a little tiny win happens. Try it. That's, go. That's your thing. That sounds pretty fucking good, actually. <laughs> That's I knew. I knew it wasn't a mistake to hire you one day before <laughs> day shooting before. the movie. <laughs> yeah, so so she lets out this little smile and then and then clearly the alien who has an understanding of the of the layout of the house um gets inside and she's locked the door though into the room that she's in. Yes. And so he tries to slowly smash his way through. And this is then where return of uh-huh. Jack Palance, who is yes. not dead smashes a window open and starts firing bullets at the alien and gets her to escape through the window so now mm. now they're a, they're a team back together yeah. which is great yes and he leads um, her back towards the shed which he's he explains he's ex, he's rigged up explosives to the shed with a good proper 
Roadrunner style TNT yes. box. <laughs> yes, it's a proper push down with your two hands. Acme. <laughs> Acme, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so at this point, we are now just going to kill the alien. No one wants to know where mm-hmm. it's from anymore because Martin Landau no. is just gone. Where's he? Well, he, he, he's probably still driving around for a bit, but then he does rock up, doesn't he? Oh, so yes, he, rocks he does up rock to, up. And he halts proceedings. And, he's, right. and then he's saying, ah, now you're an alien to uh, Palance. Um, yeah, and the alien arrives and he just it's just watching them. It's just stood in a field watching them have this crazy off. It's brilliant <laughs> because they're, it's just like it's all happening between them and it's just happily observing these stupid humans. That's right, yeah. And... He's properly going into his veteran chat, and Palance yeah. is trying to talk him out of it. Um, and what what That's happens? That's when he frisbees. Then? He frisbees two oysters at Landau, and then Lando goes down. And I think that's the moment where we where we discover that it is Ninja Star frisbee action. Yes, that going is from it. Yeah. Like, ah, okay. They're not <laughs> That's hurting. That's where they're coming from. Yeah. That's where they're coming from. But Palance shoots the alien, and it kind of just pisses out of its shoulder. <laughs> Oh yeah, it's like yeah, a yeah. yellow, le- it's yellow, like a water. yellow stream that comes out, and then he just kind of touches it to plug the hole. And yeah, it, it's just done, and it does. And possibly the greatest moment in the entire film for me is oh, yeah. Jack Palance charging at the alien, screaming "Alien!" <laughs> He's just going, alien! (laughs) As he's charging towards it. So he makes the decision at this time because we get to watch him get frisbeed twice but survive it. So, Mm -hmm. yes. Like he's he's cracked how to defeat the alien, which is to literally just cut off the oyster thing from the oyster, yeah. Yeah, just really quickly, which no one else has thought to do. Yeah, kind of like a leech, I guess. Just like you burn it off quickly. Yeah. Exactly. So he then says to Taranata, "I'm going in. You need to. You need to push the dynamite and kill me and the alien in order for you to survive." Yes. And so he runs in, yelling, "Alien!" And <laughs> he he gets the alien, and the alien starts following him into the shed. And then Taranata yeah. goes for the explosion, but it turns out that the wiring has not been attached. Attached at all. <laughs> now someone who yeah you know i as far as i know from her character she's never held a gun before we she's never no. she doesn't even really go out into the open you know when they no. were in the car and the lake she was kind of like out of her depth yeah nothing nothing suggests that she would know any basic understanding of how to wire an explosive, explosive. yes <laughs> but that is now her job i wouldn't look i wouldn't push that down and go oh these wires have to be in this intricate sort of winded figure of eight, surely on this thing. I wouldn't do that. I'd just be like, fuck it. This is, it's over. That's it done. Yeah. And end, end the movie there, but no, yep. like somehow she, <laughs> maybe, you know, in moments of panic, you know, when they say people can lift up a car, lift cars, like yeah. certain energy, maybe, maybe we can she all it- wire. Yeah. We can all wire a, an Acme dynamite <laughs> style bomb. <laughs> in desperate need and and so she mm. does manage to successfully do it the alien who's interestingly confused about what to pay attention to at this point yes. he's sort of looking he doesn't know at, whether to go to her or yeah, to deal with him like, well, should i be with jack palance who somehow is still alive despite having i don't know if he managed to get the thing off his back no, I know I think he's still on his back. It's still there so he's actually outlived everyone else in the movie by a factor of a fuck ton because this alien yes. is definitely killing him, but he's just somehow survived. Yeah. And it's really confused. It's like, do I go there? Do I go here? Where Where am I going? He fortunately stays. Um, <laughs> or she. I don't, don't know. Don't know the gender of the alien. To, or they. Or they. And wires it and slams it down. And then big explosion. And that's your that's your alien and your palance <laughs> exploded. Yeah. And we, but, and we don't really get an epilogue as such we just kind of get a shot of the stars and a repeat of sarge's crazy speech about we ain't alone out here 
Yeah, there may be, yeah, there there's definitely people out there. Um, yes, we're not the only life form. Yeah, they hate swinging lamps. Um, <laughs> that's and then yeah, you're right. That's it. It's Without like a hand to the stars, and that's it. And you sort of get to the end and you go, what, so what was the point of this? That's um, the thing. Yeah, I, I, you come away kind of going, if the whole PTSD thing didn't work out well for him. You know, he didn't get any help. He died as a madman. There was no resolve on that. Yeah. Alien. But yeah, I, I, I don't really know the point of it, but I'm glad it exists. I'll tell you that. Oh, yeah. 10 out of 10 for me. It's a <laughs> absolute journey. And yeah. as I say, just like, you know, how do you bring something special to an acting role? Well, have a watch of this movie and get have a, a gimmick masterclass in absolutely sticking out. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> being each, memorable. Yeah, each character sticks out completely. You're right. Yeah. They make it their own. Wow. Yeah. Well, Dad, thank you so much for that. Um, I know you. you've got thank quite, you a, quite a big day tomorrow. Um, so thank you for, for watching this and chatting with me on such a, an important eve. I couldn't not after I saw it. I couldn't, I couldn't back yeah. out. I, was, I explained to Fenella, I was like, look, if you need to go ahead to the hospital without me, I need to... <laughs> I need to analyze this before I'm out of here. <laughs> so I'm glad we found time tonight before Bless the actual you. day. Yeah. And um, where's the best place to get the book? Is there a best place? Or... Oh, just uh, everywhere. So um, yeah. in terms of like, you know, online, there's yeah. obviously places like Amazon or there's um, there's lots of independent shops which yes. are uh, send books out online or in independent actual physical bookshops or waterstones um mm. i've been i've been wondering I around have to, with books London. i have to go in i I, mm. I just love being in there and that smell of pages i just have to do it yeah i agree i i i mean i i do order offline as well because sometimes it's just convenience but bookshops are my life and so mm. i that's that's where i live and so actually to be able to have gone around central london because it only came out last week and mm. see my book in a bookshop has been Man. the most wonderful feeling in the world it's it's honestly just i got quite emotional when i saw in a few specific shops where no when i first arrived in the uk and i was going to these you know these like waterstones in notting hill yeah. or waterstones in piccadilly the big one you know to yeah. see my book right at the front sort of face out has been yeah it's been awesome I'm so happy for you man i i think it's amazing and you deserve it and um and i can't wait to read it for one but listen you should probably get a good night's sleep yeah, I didn't go to bed. <laughs> it's all going to go crazy. Um, thank you so, so much. And a happy Halloween. Stevie, you are awesome. This show is awesome. Thank you for having me back. I just, I will always say yes if you ask me. So I <laughs> Good please, please ask again, because it's just if only will. for the recommendations. Exactly. All right. Thank you, buddy. Lots of love. Thanks so much. Bye, dude. There we go. What a brilliantly brilliant guy Dan is. And you heard the man. If I ever ask him back, he'll say yes. So he is officially a recurring character now on Brain Rot. Thank you, Dan. And congratulations on the book. As I said, next week, get your pumpkins ready as I sit down with Sophie Ellis Bexter to talk all things hack o lantern In the interim, why don't you reach out and get in touch? On Twitter and Letterboxd, it's Stevie's Brain Rot. On Instagram and Facebook, it's Brain Rot Pod. Or you can email me the address is steviesbrainrot at gmail.com. You can email me anything. I won't always reply, but you know, <laughs> it's nice to have something in the inbox. All right. Well, I'll see you next week for Halloween, Rotters. Toodle! Toodle!